Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. The League of Women Voters of San Diego is pleased to host this candidates forum for San Diego County Board of Supervisors District 4. This is a special primary election to fill the vacant seat for the remainder of the current term, which ends in January of 2027. If no candidate receives the majority vote at the primary election, which is August 15th, then a special general election will be held on November 7th. My name is Elizabeth Brady. I'm a proud member of the League of Women Voters and your moderator for this afternoon. A couple of housekeeping rules. The bathrooms are directly out this door. And please silence your cell phones. I love it. The candidates are all checking. That's awesome. <laughs> Good. The League of Women Voters was founded in 1920. That's just six months before the 19th Amendment was passed, which of course gave women the right to vote. The League is proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties, but always working on vital issues of concern to our members and the public. As part of our mission to educate voters, we're pleased to pre present this candidates forum. It's an opportunity for you, the community, to ask questions you care the most about and a chance for the candidates to explain their positions. It's a forum for the voters, not a debate between candidates. A little bit about how this is gonna work. We're gonna use the League of Women Voters standard candidate forum format, which the candidates have all agreed to in advance. League members Diane Dunaway and Pam Curtis, here, wait. They are going to pass out index cards and pencils to you so that you can write down your questions. So you can give a little wave now if you want, if you're looking for those. We will not be asking questions from the floor, so it's important to write them down on the card. If you need assistance, they're happy to help you with that. Other things you should know, please keep your questions succinct. We're not going to be able to read a long preamble. Make sure it's related to this election, meaning it's something that a county board of supervisor could actually influence. Keep your questions to the point. You can ask as many questions as you want. All we ask is that it's one question per card. Now, our sorters today are Stephanie Sontag and Vicki Ricks. What are they sorting for? First of all, they're making sure it's relevant to the election at hand. They're making sure that um, the topics that have the greatest level of interest from the community get asked first, so we get those big issues and we don't run out of time. Um, and they're making sure that anything that's inappropriate is set aside. Inappropriate meaning not polite or kind. All right, so the candidates are gonna have two minutes for an opening statement. At the end, they'll have two minutes for a closing statement. And in between, we're gonna barrage them with your questions. They're gonna have one minute to answer, but as moderator, I always reserve the right to throw in a speed round if necessary. The order of the candidates has been randomly selected. In order to help us keep track, we have a timer. Jeannie Brown is right here in the front row. She's gonna help the candidates by holding up paddles that show the remaining time left. So candidates, when, it's, when you're on a two minute open and close, she'll give you a one minute warning, and a 30 second warning, a 15 second warning, and a stop. Otherwise, it'll be the same on a one minute, but obviously, you'll start at the 30 seconds. Now, I am a stickler about stopping on time. You can finish your sentence, but otherwise I'm gonna cut you off, okay? Thank you for that. So back to the audience's responsibilities. In addition to asking excellent questions, you have some other things that can help us be successful. Please hold all of your applause until the forum is finished. This allows us to ask more questions and keep things moving. Since the candidate forum is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for undecided voters, any demonstration of support or opposition to candidates or positions will be out of order. Unheeded warnings may result in the cancellation of this forum. Now, are we ready to begin? All right, wonderful. So we'll start with the opening statements in the order of the draw. Do we have a question? Okay, we're gathering questions. Is our timer ready? Fantastic. We'll start with candidate Goldbeck. Well, good morning, everyone. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here on this beautiful Saturday morning. My name is Janessa Goldbeck, and I was born and raised right here in San Diego County. My mom was a public school teacher. My dad drove a tow truck. I was really fortunate to go to school, studied African studies and journalism at Northwestern University. And my studies took me abroad, where I learned about an ongoing genocide in the Darfur region of Sudan. I was fired up to do something about it. I came back to, San, or back to my campus, started organizing, and wound up as the national organizing director for the student movement and the genocide. I moved to Washington, D.C. for the first chapter of my career to take that work uh, into the professional realm. That's where I learned to pass federal legislation to protect people in conflict zones and totally got the bug for making change at the highest levels of government. Uh, that work took me uh, into conflict zones where for the first time I interacted with the U.S. military. I was born and raised in Encinitas. My m military experience was my dad telling me to never go to Oceanside as his only daughter. Um, <laughs> but I saw firsthand the importance of the Marine Corps uh, and the military. So I made a strange choice at the age of 26. I joined the Marine Corps, served as a combat engineer officer for seven years, and might have served for longer, but my mom got really sick. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I'm an only child. My parents were divorced. So I came back home to take care of her. For the last couple of years, I've been running a national veterans advocacy organization that represents over a million and a half vets and military families. Our job is to lift up their voices and make change for them at the federal, state, and local level. I decided to get into this race back in February, actually before the Nathan Fletcher scandal erupted, uh, thinking the, the election would be in a few years, because I want to bring my 15 years of experience working to make real change in people's lives and put it to work here for my hometown in San Diego County. The county is where the rubber meets the road on some of our pressing challenges, whether that's the homelessness crisis, the cost of living, um, or rising crime. I want to do the work here in San Diego County and make a difference. I'm really honored to be with you here today, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> oh, really, people? Breaking the rules already? <laughs> I think they were just excited I hit the time. Thank out. you for holding your applause. <laughs> Candidate Riker. By a show of hands, how many of you, is, this is your very first forum? Alrighty, well welcome. Well, we've done five so far. This is number five. So it is so great and so refreshing to be out here in the community. Last year, I ran against Nathan Fletcher and he refused to do any candidate forums or any town halls. And it's so important for community engagement to have these. So thank you for taking your time out on a Saturday. Now, I've lived here in San Diego since I was four years old, and I grew up in Tirasana. My mom was a secretary, and my dad worked at FedMart. How many of you remember FedMart? <laughs> it's the 1970s version of Walmart. Uh, when I was eight years old, my dad was diagnosed with MS, and so I very much know what it's like to live in a family where San Diego is just not an affordable place to live, and we struggled. I'm very fortunate that I was able to go on through scholarships, and I graduated from San Diego State University. After I got my degree in political science, that's when my mom, who adopted me and who I consider my mom, told me my biological mother's real name. And so at the age of 25, before Google, I searched for her, and I found her. And that's when I realized I had a knack for it. And I got my license as a private investigator in California in 1999. Fast forward to just the past few years, I never really used my political science degree, but then I saw tremendous suffering in the past couple years. There were city workers, fire, police, lifeguards, dispatchers who were going to lose their jobs, and so we were able to step in and save thousands of workers' jobs and protect them. And then even this year, the San Diego Community College District threatened to fire 50 pr professors, and so one of the things I'm really proud of is in the past few years, being able to protect workers and help people and alleviate suffering. And I just want to say thank you again. I am here to serve, and I can't wait to hear your questions. Candidate Montgomery Stepp. Well, good morning, everyone. First, let me start off by thanking the League of Women Voters for putting this and a, a couple more forums that we have on uh, coming up to make sure that we uh, get out the vote as much as possible in this short time frame that we have. So as was stated, uh, good morning. I'm, I'm really glad to be in City Heights this morning. My name is Monica Montgomery Stepp. Uh, I am running for County Board of Supervisors, but I currently serve as a city council member for District 4, which is a neighbor to District 3, where we are now. 
Um, I have been so grateful and honored that my district that I grew up in uh, to get, took the trust in me to make decisions, very important decisions about their quality of life. And those decisions extend out to the entire city of San Diego. Um, I am the only candidate in this race that actually has represented folks. Um, I represent 160,000 people of the 750,000 people that are in the entire supervisorial district. Um, I have convened over the city's budget, $5.2 billion budget um, as budget chair at the city of San Diego, where in our last budget we were able to place almost a million dollars in for improvements to Hidwood Park that is near us right now. Uh, we're very proud of the record that I have in shaping the conversation around equity throughout the entire city and making sure that the budget decisions that we make now have an equity lens that are put towards them so that we are investing in communities that have seen disinvestment for at least the last four decades. And that experience, I think, is going to be important coming into this supervisor's race and this seat, understanding all of the crises that we face as a region right now. I'm really excited to talk with you this morning. Um, born and raised in San Diego. Like I said, District 4 uh, raised me, and so I'm honored to be sitting here before you today with an opportunity to represent this entire region. I look forward to your questions in this conversation. Thank you. Candidate McQuick. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Leader of Women Voters, and thank you to everyone who's uh, here on their uh, Saturday morning. Uh, I'm the least known candidate, um, so what, if anyone could pull up their cell phones real quick and go to the browser and type in Paul McQuaid, the number four, San Diego, all one, all one word, um, that will pull up my website, and I'll give you a quick notes. Um, I am not from San Diego. Uh, I was stationed here as a Marine, and I was supposed to retire here. On my last combat deployment, um, I was hit in the face with a bomb, and um, I lost over 60% of my tongue, and it had to be rebuilt. And that's why I had this good accent. <laughs> Uh, I chose to retire here as a single father. Um, my son went to Patrick Henry High School. Um, this is my neighborhood. Um, I live in Webster. Um, my son's first girlfriend was off of Ridgeview Drive, lived off Ridgeview Drive. Um, I've also moved both my parents here. So my mom is here, she's sitting in the front row. <laughs> she lives in Oceanside. Uh, my father is 89 years old, he lives in San Marcos. I also manage his medical and financial affairs. So I have a vested interest in staying here in San Diego and improving San Diego to what it was when I decided to stay here in San Diego County, to bring more people here, not have four out of 10 Californians wanting to leave California. Um, I want people to also raise their families here that I've raised my son here. Um, the house I live in is not my house, that house is for my son. When he comes back from college, that's gonna be his house. So I've always planted my flag here in San Diego. I chose to stay there. Um, well, I could have gone anywhere else in the world. And um, I'm happy to be there to answer your questions and continue to make San Diego um, that place that it was when I decided to stay there. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. I also have good news. We have someone who can translate questions in Spanish into English for the forum. So if you're more comfortable writing it in Spanish, we have a translator for you. So thank you to our translator. All right, let's get into some of the tougher, meaner questions, candidates. Which organization or major donors support you, and how are you going to ensure that you do not become beholden to them? Candidate Reichert first. I am very happy to say that I have the endorsement of two of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors, and I also have the endorsement of five local mayors. Uh, just this past week, both Janessa and I were co-endorsed by the East County Chamber. And I would have to say that uh, my support is mostly coming from the people. Uh, if you look at my contributions, uh, you, will, you will not see uh, special interests. And that information is all publicly available. And I encourage everybody to look at that. So what I'm really happy to say is 
that my support comes from the people, and it's because I put the people first. Thank you. Candidate Montgomery Stepp. Thank you for the question. So just briefly, uh, in, back in 2018, uh, when I ran for city council, I had no major institutional support. I did have two unions that were supporting me at that time, but it did allow us to build a foundation of independence as a council member, and I think that that's very important. I'm proud to have the Democratic Party endorsement. I'm proud to have the Labor Council endorsement, which uh, represents so many of our working families across the region, and also to note, uh, the Deputy Sheriff's Association and the Police Officers Association will be coming after me because of the work that we have done around uh, law enforcement and reform. I will continue to do that work, and I believe that my support shows the values that I have. I'm also the daughter of two entrepreneurs, which leaves me closely tied to that community as well. We built a foundation of independence. That will not change, and I'm proud to be uh, are proud that these people put their trust in me and endorse me for this most important race. Thank you. Candidate McCoy. All of my support comes from uh, friends and family uh, throughout the world. Um, I don't have any business endorsements. Um, this is, I'm running a grassroots campaign. My family's helping me, my friends are helping me. Um, as a retired military member, I have friends all over the world, all over the country, um, that have known me for some time, some of them 30, 40 years, and they believe in me. Um, and so I don't have, I don't take any, I don't take any funds from anyone um, other that I don't know. Thank you, Kennedy Goldberg. Uh, well, uh, I am very proudly endorsed by our public safety officials, including our county firefighters, our deputy DAs, um, and investigators. I'm also very proud to say that my campaign is the only campaign that released uh, every donation that we've received since launching. Um, I have over a thousand individual contributors from friends and family, not a single dollar from a PAC or a super PAC. Uh, I believe that in order to govern successfully, you need to be transparent about where your funds come from. Um, this is an exciting opportunity to talk about our policy positions and our interests, um, but I'm, I'm very proud to say that my campaign is fully funded by grassroots support from all over the county, um, and I'm really proud to have earned the endorsement of our firefighters and public safety officials, because when I think about the, uh, the challenges ahead when it comes to our mental health crises, our addiction crises, increasing, uh, increasingly extreme weather patterns that are threatening our homes, our backcountry, sea level rise, um, it's going to be really important that we're working with these folks to solve these problems. So looking forward to digging more into that in the next few minutes. Thank you. Candidates, how does your lived experience with injustice and inequity inform how you relate to and best represent District 4 residents? We'll start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, I grew up here as an African-American young lady. Uh, uh, into a woman with parents who were both entrepreneurs. Uh, my father was impacted by Prop 209, which really uh, dissipated a lot of minority businesses in San Diego. Uh, and at that time, there was a lot of racial tension. Um, that has informed my work growing up. And so I established the Office of Race and Equity at the city of San Diego, as I spoke about before. Uh, all of our budget decisions now have to take into account those communities, our most vulnerable communities that we see every day that need more investment because they have missed out on investment for at least the last four decades. So I have done that work. In addition, a lot of my work around calling out racial profiling, I have supported our law enforcement budgets every single budget season and also additional money that they have asked for and I will still hold them accountable. In uh, 1968, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that interracial marriage, the, the, the banning of interracial marriage is unconstitutional. Uh, in the 1970s, my mother and father got married. Um, so my dad is white, my mom is black and Native American. And in 1980, when I was four years old, we moved to an all-white town outside of Chicago, Illinois. And I was the uh, oldest son uh, in the family. And um, to say I had a rough childhood is kind of an understatement. Um, however, my mother raised me to take those, take those 
bad times and turn them into something good. So I used that energy and the way I was doubted uh, by everyone to propel myself to be someone better. Um, I didn't get angry about it. Um, I didn't use my anger to ride my anger. Um, I took pride in my heritage and, my, and I researched my family all the way back to Barbados um, on my mother's side. So I used it to be the best person I am and I can see both sides okay, when it comes you. to uh, white, black and white. Uh, when I joined the Marine Corps uh, at the age of 26 in 2012, I was shocked to learn that there were still jobs that were closed to women simply on the basis of gender. Um, I, I, I thought, how could that be? Uh, and at the time, the Marine Corps was evaluating whether or not women could successfully join these all-male units. So um, I volunteered to go to the Marine, Marine Corps' toughest school, our infantry officers course, as one of four women to participate in an experiment and see how we could do. Now, I didn't pass, but a few months later, that data helped inform the commandant and uh, the president at the time, um, and they fully repealed that policy, opening all jobs to women who are qualified to do them. Uh, I do not accept the status quo. I think that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to equality. Here in the United States, we're seeing a sweeping move to criminalize and punish LGBT people for being open um, and having families and it, it living their lives. I think it's incredibly important at local government we have leaders who are not just going to be allies in that fight to push back and let everybody live their lives openly, uh, but to be champions for that. And I've been a proud champion for my community for, the, uh, for my whole life. Thanks. <clears throat> my lived experience has been a big passion of my campaign, and I've, and I've shared it along the way. Back uh, just 20 years ago, uh, my dad, who was only 56 years old, died of complications of multiple sclerosis. At the time, I was eight months pregnant, and five weeks later, after an uncomplicated normal pregnancy, my daughter Ashley was born in a coma. I held her in my arms as her heartbeat faded and her life was over as quickly as it began. There's something about suffering and tragedy that forever changes a person. And that's something that I recognize. There is intense suffering going on right now in San Diego County. I've never seen San Diego County worse off than it is right now. We have failed policies, homelessness, addiction, we have homeless people dying on our streets. It's going to take somebody who understands what suffering is to immediately jump in and save people. Thank, Thank you. you. Candidates, what do you think the county's role in addressing homelessness should be? Candidate McQuig. I feel like the county should be on the forefront and the leading edge of addressing homelessness because it's a county issue. Um, there are some great programs throughout the country um, and other places that we have not utilized. Uh, veterans Village of San Diego does what's called a Veterans Stand Down every summer. And they bring homeless veterans to San Diego High for a weekend. They house them and they bring all the services to them. There's no reason why we can't build a model for that here in San Diego and do a homeless stand down to bring all those, all those homeless people to one location, house them temporarily, and then we connect them with the services they've been using. Unfortunately, our services have spread out too far all over the county, and you can't make a difference like this when you come together like this in one place to offer it for um, the homeless. We have a budget of $8.1 billion, and that money is not being utilized properly to bring the homeless to a place where they need the services of treatment first and then housing. Thank you. Candidate Colbeck? Yeah, this is a complex problem, but the solutions are not that complicated. One, we need to have emergency shelter for people who have, are currently sleeping on the street. The county has excess land. We can easily put up prefabricated shelters, bring in services. For too long, we've put the burden on cities to solve this on their own. The county needs to be a regional leader in providing emergency shelter. Two, we are currently using our county jails as our region's largest mental health prov providers. That is unacceptable, it's wrong. People are dying in the jails because they are being put in there when they're having mental health crises or they're spiraling through addiction. We need to change that. In order to change that, we need to open the appropriate number of psychiatric beds in this county and hire behavioral health workers. I currently sit on the county's behavioral health advisory board. I hear about this month after month from our county's director. It's imperative we do that. Three. 
Our housing, our homelessness crisis is a function of our lack of affordable housing. And so we need to really dig in. That means more housing uh, everywhere that we can that's environmentally sound to do so that people can afford to live here. Seniors who are on a fixed income can afford to stay in their homes and young people can return to their hometown. Thanks. Yeah, right. Well, I shared with you about how my lived experience really informs my campaign. But what I also want to share with you is how hope informs my campaign. So I'm a big believer in recovery. I was actually able to get it for myself. And I'm so grateful for that. Now, here's what we know, that in the case of affordable housing being the root cause of homelessness, we have to do better for our domestic violence victims. We have to do better for our veterans, our elderly, our disabled. But there is also another root cause of homelessness and that is where homelessness, crime, mental illness, and addiction intersect. You cannot force people to get treatment, and it is not a crime to be homeless. However, there are people on our streets that are refusing service, and they are committing serious crimes. We need to make sure that they don't go to jail because it's not equipped for people with serious addictions and mental health issues. They have to have mandatory treatment. So my solution is, for people who are committing serious crimes, it's mandatory treatment for mentally ill and drug okay, addicted people. Thank you. Candidate Montgomery Stubbs. Yes, thank you. We really have to look at the scope of where we are in California with regard to wages not keeping up with housing costs. So wages really is very, very important. A new study was recently uh, commissioned where it showed that um, really, homelessness is an economic problem. Absolutely, people have issues, uh, mental health issues, who we see every single day. But overall, this is a failure in fighting for people to have higher wages, to be able to live here, and to keep our talent here. One in four of us is a, a paycheck away from being out on the street. We have to come to terms with that. In addition, uh, I, I served on the San Diego Workforce Partnership. I'm the chair of that board. A study was also commissioned there that showed that within the next five years, we need uh, over 18,000 behavioral health services of workers and that we have to increase their wages. So yes, this is a complex problem. No person is the same. Our services need to show as such and we can do better. Thank you. We have a question on housing. Candidates, what do you see as the county's role in increasing affordable housing? Now you think you know who's going next, but I told you I was going to mix it up and it's actually going to candidate in the quick place. Okay. Is, are we stuck on something? <laughs> this like is how I make sure they're really paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping us on our toes. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so in a row, um, the process uh, for permitting new housing and permitting um, additions to housing is too slow in San Diego counties as well as in the cities around it. Um, we need to streamline that. If housing is an emergency, then why aren't permits being issued on an emergency basis to get these houses built? Um, it's a time, um, and it also we need to have realize the all the open housing land. Um, another we also need to look at alternatives to um, dense housing. Um, growing up outside Chicago, we had Cabrini Green. We also had the Robert Taylor homes. If you know the history of Chicago, those turned into disasters because it was allow everybody in regardless of who they were. There needs to be a screening process when the county provides housing. If you're mentally ill or you're on drugs or you're selling drugs, they're not getting in. Uh, keep those bad elements out, provide them an alternative to clean their lives up or get the treatment that they need. And then once they reach that, reach that threshold, then they get allowed in. Thank you. Can they become Really mixing it up. Okay. Um, yes, ab absolutely. So the county does have land that it can certainly um, build on with regard to housing, but it is absolutely correct that it takes at least five years to build something in San Diego. So what that does is it one allows people, uh, or it prevents people from being from being able to build. Um, it discourages people from building or it increases the cost, which then is carried on to the folks that will be renting. So, or the taxpayer through sub subsidies. So um, it's very important that we streamline certain processes. 
um, so that we can uh, build at a quicker rate. But I will say that you know, when we talk about building out our communities, we have to provide resources when we provide density. Um, it is not just about putting a lot of homes or a lot of apartments in one area without providing people the things that they need to sustain and survive. Candidate Riker. By a show of hands, how many of you know of a family, friend, or loved one who has left San Diego County because it's not affordable? Yeah, this, this is happening. And one of the things that I keep hearing from people is, I'm moving to Tennessee, I'm moving to Texas, I'm moving to Florida so I can buy a home. So it isn't just that people can't afford rent here, it's because there's not enough housing. So it is a supply and demand issue as well. And I'm gonna say something kind of controversial here, but I have some serious reservations about SB 10. SB 10, the idea is, is to go into neighborhoods where single family homes are being bulldozed and these huge high rises are being built in its place. And these units are not for sale, they are for rent. And so they are controlled by big corporations. And in many cases, these big high rises, a lot of these units are being used for Airbnbs. And so we have an unhealthy real estate market here. So I think government can help by getting out of the way. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, we have a, a, a lack of housing here, a lack of affordable housing at every income level. I'm very fortunate. Um, I live uh, just five minutes away in Talmadge, and I was very fortunate to be able to buy my home while I'm in the per a process of buying my home back from the bank, but I was able to invest in a home because I signed my name on the dotted line to die for my country. I have a VA loan, and I don't think that should be the bar for home ownership for anyone. Um, I'm unfortunately one of few people my age in my neighborhood, and so yes, we can build more housing on county land. We can evaluate where we can uh, speed up permitting processes, but we also need to look at prevention, and we know in San Diego County that 29% of our homeless population are people over the age of 55. And most of those people are homeless for the first time. This means that people who invested in our community, who raised their families here, who contributed tax dollars, are being forced out onto the streets. I think that's wrong. The county currently has a pilot program to fund uh, seniors, provide a couple hundred bucks to their landlords to keep them in their homes. That is the humane and moral thing to do for our elders. We should expand that program, make it permanent for other populations as well. Thank you, Candace. What is your position on changing the current board policy on development in areas outside the current towns and corporations? We'll start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. So I've been very uh, consistent in saying this, that I support uh, what the county has recently done with the vehicle miles traveled standard that we are talking about. Um, to prevent uh, unnecessary sprawl out in our communities, uh, especially unincorporated areas. Uh, at the same time, we have to balance that and monitor that policy to make sure that we are not only meeting our climate action goals, but that we are putting ourselves in a position to build more housing. I think with every policy that is passed by a board, a city council, um, whatever it is, that that policy needs to be reevaluated to make sure that we are meeting all of our goals. But I do support what the county has done. I have an eye on it to, mo to monitor it because we can do this in 2023. We can protect our climate and we can build more housing. Um, it's not an either or, we have to figure it out. We have state mandates that we have to follow. We, we have the responsibility to do that and I think we can. Candidate Riker. Right. Yes, the, the state's VMT is definitely placing caps on what can be built, and I am a supporter of building sensibly in our eastern parts of our unincorporated county as well as our southeastern parts of our county. And yes, we can do both. We can protect our climate and we can build sensibly. Because here's the unintended consequences of not building in San Diego County. We all know of people who commute daily from southern Riverside County. They come from Temecula because housing is more affordable up there. I also have dear friends who live in Tijuana, across the border, in Playas, and they travel every day to go to work because it's more affordable to live in Tijuana than it is to live in San Diego County. And these are people who serve us. They're our teachers, they're our firefighters, and they, live, they can't even live in this county. 
And I'm telling you right now, we need to have sensible building in this county because what's happening is we're making the environment worse because people are stuck at the border and with all of those emissions clogging up our environment and also people coming from Riverside. Thank you. If you guys are getting good, you know I'm going to cut you off. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Candidate Goldman. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that our, we've said over and over again, a lack of affordable housing is the primary driver of homelessness. A lack of affordable housing is a primary driver of people leaving the state. Uh, we need to build more housing, and we need to do it in a smart way that is in line with our climate goals. Now, recently, this, the county did a study where they evaluated where areas of development were in East County that were close to public transit. And they said those places are okay to build in East County because there's public transit and that will reduce emissions. Uh, then they ruled out a whole bunch of parts of the la of land that are that are in sensible places that are already in urban centers, urban villages in East County, and said you can't build there because there's no public transit. Well, instead of taking that land off the map, why don't we just put public transit to those areas? The county has the ability to do that. We can put clean, efficient buses on the roads in a relatively quick amount of time, open that land up, and build housing for people who need it. If we don't do that, we're just going to see these problems getting worse and worse. <clears throat> uh, so that's a strong my thunder. But, um, <laughs> but I'm going to pick it back off the bat. The farther this would go from the main highways, and we need to. The, the, tra the public transit system, transit system in San Diego County is broken. A person shouldn't have to wake up at 4 30 in the morning to get to a 7 30 in the morning shift. Um, my son had to take the bus a couple of times uh, to Cathedral Catholic for football training when I was able to take, when I was able to, unable to pick him. He recited a, a long list of bus lines who had to text in order to get from our house all the way up to Delmont. Um, and major cities do have a major infrastructure of public transportation. There's too many ideas where we're just California ideas and we're not seeking ideas from other places. We have an entire country and an entire world we get ideas from. Sacramento got the ideas from a book from a bullet train from Japan. That's a disaster. If we took money like that and put it into our public transportation system down here in San Diego, we could have a train that runs from Yuma all the way to San Diego. Candidate, oh, let's go to a new question. Since we started talking about transportation, what are your thoughts on transportation? And when was the last time you rode the trolley to the border? Got it? Mm. We're going to start right. with Candidate Riker. What a great question. Well, I was a single mom. I, I raised my kids here in this county as a single mom, and I didn't have reliable transportation. And I had a job that I worked on the weekends. And what happened was there wasn't bus service on the weekends. And so, yes, our public transportation system is broken. And I do ask people to raise their hands a lot. Here in the room, how many of you take public transportation five times a week? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Here's the thing. I think that what we really need is last mile connectivity. Because as a single mom, when you're taking your kids to school, oftentimes your kids might go to two or three different schools. So it just isn't practical to be able to take a bus and to drop off your kids at all of these different schools. And so we need solutions like last mile connectivity that will help people who are elderly or disabled or single moms. There's public safety issues about riding the trolley. There's homeless encampments at every single uh, stop. Thank you very much. We go to candidate Goldbeck, please. Yes. Last night at our last forum, we had three minutes to answer, so I think we're all kind of adjusting <laughs> to that time frame. Um, when it comes to public transit in San Diego County, one thing that really frustrates me is a lack of just thinking about some immediate, tangible things we can do to make it more accessible. One thing, I know a lot of people feel very unsafe on our public transit system. So let's think about ways that we can make them cleaner and safer uh, and, and make sure that people feel okay using them. Second, our trolley is very slow because it has to stop all the time for road crossings. If we were to build road overpasses over trolley stops that one, speeds up the trolley, it reduces accidents, and it reduces noise in neighborhoods that have to slow down or listen to the trolley horn. These are not like billion dollar solutions. They are practical solutions, increasing the frequency of the buses we already have on the road so that they come more often and people are waiting for less times. All of these things are sim not simple, but they are shorter term solutions to things while we think about how we expand and invest in our system more globally. 
I'll answer these questions backwards. Um, the last time I took the solid for the board of it was probably in 1997, 1998, when I was stationed at the Hoot Depot, and uh, we were going to Suze. However, after 9 11, and so that's just going to attest to this, Mexico was off limits to Marines. So it wouldn't matter if, it, if I took the solid for the board or not, I wasn't really going in the solid. Uh, so that's my story. Uh, as far as transportation, um, I've always said that the transportation system is broken. Um, and then there's increasing taxes on gas, the gas tax. Um, we were just hit with a tax right before the 4th of July weekend, which is one of the biggest travel weekends in the nation. Right? And now they want to stand that once another mileage tax is going to hit people that travel the farthest the most. And those are the working families that people like you said live in Mexico or, or Mexico. Um, we're being taxed to death on things, and we're not seeing a return on the roads that they promised us we're going to be repaired over time. Candidate Montgomery Stout. So I think the last time I rode the trolley to the border, I was um, a teenager, and I'm, so I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I did, uh, pre-pandemic and before I was able to purchase an electric car, um, I used to take the trolley to City Hall quite often just because we, it was convenient. I could park at the station, ride into City Hall, and, and get off right there. So it was very convenient. Um, and I do love our trolley system. And I do agree with what has been said uh, with regard to as we build out these larger systems, which t they really take decades to build out. If you're changing a transit system, that is just a reality. You can't snap your fingers and make that happen. Uh, we have been instituting uh, some of these more quick, in government time, quick is three years, just <laughs> FYI, uh, <laughs> solutions to make sure that people have more frequency, have those overpasses, and have the types of things that will allow them to make the transit system more convenient. As a county board of supervisor for the fourth district, how will you ensure we obtain adequate funding for housing, employment, and health care? Candidate Goldbeck. Thanks. Wow. Well, we absolutely um, need to get make sure that San Diego County gets our fair share, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, we don't. Uh, we get our butt kicked by other counties across the state when it comes to per capita federal funding, including counties like Imperial County. I don't think that's right. We need to change that. There are historic amounts of funding coming for climate resilient infrastructure, for building more affordable housing, uh, coming from bills like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. We need to make sure that San Diego County is primed and has the right people in place to go after those grants, go after that funding and bring it home and put it to work. Um, I'm really proud to say I'm endorsed by the majority of our federal delegation here in San Diego County, the majority of our state legislative de delegation as well. Um, I've worked with folks at the federal and state level before to pass legislation that makes a real difference in people's lives, like uh, expanding veterans health care benefits to over 5 million new veterans, which we did last year as part of a coalition. And I'm going to put that experience to work to make sure that every single dollar we deserve comes home to San Diego County so that we can not only take advantage of those funds, but be a leader when it comes to infrastructure and redevelopment here in San Diego. Candidate <laughs> The county budget is $8 billion, and nearly half of it comes from state and federal funding. The state government currently has a $96 billion deficit. Deficit. So it's going to be really difficult to try to get state funding. And also, we all know about the debt ceiling and the problem with the federal government. I think it's really important uh, for the county that we not actually be over-reliant on getting state and federal funding. We need to get our fair share. So we are absolutely correct to be advocates to get what we deserve here in San Diego County, but we also need to be sensible. Right now, we have a reserve with our county, and we need to protect that because all economists are saying that a recession is coming. We're gonna have an economy downturn. And so we can sit here and say, we want this program and that program, and that there is just magic money that's gonna come from the state or federal government. But until the state gets its act together and eliminates its deficit, we can't count on them. We have to take care of ourselves. Candidate Montgomery Stout. Yes, so we absolutely need to continue to go after state funding in addition to what is already coming through 
uh, the county's budget. I, I think that you know, having uh, stability there is extremely important. What we have done at the City of San Diego is built out a government affairs department that is dedicated to grant writing and dedicated to seeing what types of money that we can apply for. And that needs to be uh, mirrored at the County of San Diego. It has to be a priority. Otherwise, it will be a bunch of one-offs um, that will not allow us to do consistent programming. There is a thing called ongoing funding sources. Those are the things that we need from the state. Because right now, with the, for example, with regard to, to our homelessness funding, um, we go year by year wondering if our programming is even successful programming is going to be funded the next year. So not only do we have to go after state funding, but we have to go after a specific type. Um, and that's very, very important. Candidate McQuick. <coughs> Although the state has a deficit, the state still provides. Um, during the pandemic, they sent us trailers to be used um, for homeless shelters. San Diego City Council didn't use those trailers. There was an investigation to try to find out what happened to those trailers. And three of them are still missing. So if, it's, if the state's going to provide it, we need to use it for what it's provided for and not just ship it somewhere to ship it for every day. Um, I founded a nonprofit uh, when I was a police and fire commissioner in uh, Oceanside. I've also worked with, I also work with a number of other nonprofits. A grant writing individual uh, um, or a section of your organization that just writes grants, that's all they do is worth the work and goal. If there's money out there, you send the grant writers after it, and that's all they do is they focus on that. So if the city has a grant writing uh, cell, the counties have a grant writing cell as well. And all they do is sit there and they write grants all the time. That's what they're paid to do. That's their job, that's their bread and butter. Um, and then those grants, when they come in, we use them effectively and for what they are earmarked for and not for other projects. We have a series of questions around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Let's start with this one. Please explain how you would help to extend county contracting with black-owned businesses. This goes first to candidate Montgomery Stepp. So I talked a little bit about Prop 209, and I cannot do this in one minute, but what that did was take away um, affirmative action in the state of California. And the reason why that's important is because since that was passed, um, we as an entire state, uh, and particularly these communities, have lost over $2 billion um, in, in money that could have been self-sustaining. This was not anyone um, that was giving out money. These were businesses that were thriving because there was a mandate to include them. And what that did was recognize that we still have issues in California, right, when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and it was a way to bridge those gaps. So with, up against that backdrop, there is now a legal requirement to have a disparity study in our various government entities that show that type of disparity. So then we can enact laws that concentrate on the areas that are suffering the most. I have done that uh, in government. I've done that at the city. I've worked up and down the state with regard to this this subject, and I will do the same at the county. Candidate McQuaid. <clears throat> I know of um, a number of uh, black-owned construction companies that have uh, been trying to push for um, to build in Webster and Ridgeview in the community I live in. They get a lot of pushback. We have a brand new Puerto Rico that is opening up um, on Euclid uh, within the next couple months. Um, there was supposed to be a huge building built where the old pop, uh, church of chicken is. What we're getting, though, when these black owned businesses approach other companies is pushback from those companies because the neighborhoods where they want to build have high crime. They don't want to build in high crime neighborhoods. The old Jack in the Box on Euclid and Federal, when, when it used to be a sit down restaurant, my son's friend was working at counter when they were robbed with a pistol. Now, you can only walk up and go to his life and you can't even go inside the restaurant anymore because Jack and Box knocked it down and did it that way. Until we can clean up the neighborhoods where we want to bring black owned businesses into and reduce the crime, we're not going to get corporations that want to come in. Home Depot, uh, not Home Depot, Big Lots West, now we have that open building. Um, and I, yeah, one minute's not enough. Candidate <laughs> <laughs> Riker. What I actually have found in the past year is that, sadly, the county 
and the city and the state have not been living up to its stated goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's been a significant portion of the community that has been left behind. And oftentimes, uh, these contracts are going to special interests and to consultants. And so what I would be in favor of is anything that is identifiable, that we can actually spread these contracts out to black-owned businesses, to marginalized communities, to minority owners, to women, to make sure that truly that the county, city, and state are living up to their goals of equity. Candidate Goldman. So uh, a couple of years ago, I started my own uh, small business here in San Diego County, and um, I, as a veteran, a disabled veteran, a woman, and a member of the LGBTQ community, there are a number of different things I can qualify for that the Small Business Association would then help me sort of understand how to build and grow my business, apply for federal contracts. There's a ton of connectivity there. When I've sat down with uh, small business owners here in the county, black-owned businesses, my other minority-owned businesses, as well as nonprofits, what I hear consistently is when they're trying to compete for county contracts, uh, whether they're a nonprofit or a for-profit, the system is just really, uh, it really favors bigger organizations that have a lot more capacity, a lot of more lawyers, a lot more development staff, et cetera. So I think a tangible thing the county can do uh, while the state and the federal government and the city figure out how to be more proactive about this is to provide services and education for those, enti for those smaller organizations, for black owned businesses, other minority owned entities, um, so that they understand how to navigate the system and aren't disadvantaged by these larger organizations that have that. The LGBTQ community is under increasing attack across the nation. How, as county supervisor, do you plan to show leadership and support of our local LGBTQ community? We'll start with candidate Reichert. Last Monday, we all had a chance to go to a community forum in Hillcrest, and it was amazing. It was much like this. There were 130 people there, and it was great. Uh, so many people came out to hear from the candidates, and I was really happy to say that many people in the gay community came out to support me. And one of the things I'm really proud about is I'm endorsed by Gina Roberts. She is part of the San Diego County Human Rights Commission. She is a commissioner, and she is a trans woman. And you have my word that I will absolutely protect and defend the LGBTQ youth, and I will also protect minorities and marginalized communities. My heart is to serve everyone. And as county supervisor, there are two things really that you're in charge of at the end of the day, and that's public health and public safety. And so each group has its own different needs, and we need to be able to represent everyone. Thank you. Can I go back? Uh, you know, I joined the Marine Corps uh, a couple of weeks before Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended. I uh, signed my contract when that policy was still in place, and I had no idea it was going to be repealed while I was serving. Uh, I was incredibly fortunate that it was, and I was able to serve openly as myself. It, it mattered a lot, and it didn't matter at all. Uh, I was just able to go about my business and be myself without having to hide. And I think everyone deserves that opportunity, no matter who they are. We're seeing historic numbers of anti-LGBTQ legislation across state legislators and across the country. It's a scary time. If you're a parent of an LGBTQ kid or you're a family member or you are a member of the community like I am, um, it is a scary time. And I think it's really important that we not only stand up to hate, but we speak out and find the intersectionality between communities who are being targeted by hateful groups. We should all be in this fight together. If you are a member of the black community, a member of the brown community, if you are an LGBTQ person, you know what it's like to walk into a place and be stared at and looked at. And we need supervisors who are going to reach out, build those bonds across communities, uh, and stand up and fight back uh, against hate. Candidate Montgomery Stubb. <laughs> yes, it's a great question. So uh, I have, in, in my roles in various capacities, whether I was at the ACLU or a city council member or practicing law, have been a strong supporter of the LGBTQ community, understanding that no community is a monolith, so being uh, trying to support as much as I can, whether it be the LGBTQ uh, Black Co Coalition, uh, the LGBTQ Latino Coalition, um, all of the different parts of the community that need their voices to be heard. Absolutely, we've done that. 
with discretionary funding and through my office, but also, you know, continuing these conversations around um, equity. It's important that we begin to collect data that reflects the disparity in the LGBTQ community so that we as a county can continue to support those. It's also important with regard to our public health decisions that we are including community members that can give us um, the advice that is coming directly from the community about the needs and the resources that we can provide as a county with regard to public health. Candidate McCoy. Yes. <coughs> Um, so my, uh, my, my brother-in-law is Jay, and uh, he's uh, a successful entrepreneur in uh, Los Angeles. Um, him and I spend my holidays together, so that's about the only time we have to get together. Um, when his partner had an affair on him, he confided in me, it's a big thing, I had enough, I meant a lot to him. Um, so we're going to have bad actors in the community, right? Um, and to label an entire community as a bad actor, LBCQ, black, Asian, um, that's not what we do. We look at each person case by case, right? And you hold those bad actors accountable, and then you move on, right? You don't punish the 90% for so the 10, what the 10% have done, or uh, restrict the 90% for what the 10% have done. So if we focus on the ones that are actually causing problems in any community, you know, we can help clean up that community, offer them an alternative to their behavior, and then move forward as one. In this era of diversity, equity, and inclusion, often access is denied or neglected for people with disabilities. We have a shortage of ASL interpreters in San Diego. How will you ensure people with disabilities receive services? Candidate Goldbeck. Thank you for, so much for this question. I think this is the first question we've had on this topic in all of our forums. Um, you know, there. this is a, a topic that, that often goes overlooked. We certainly have a number of folks um, in our community who do not get anywhere near the services they deserve uh, or need. Uh, we see a lot of folks on the streets because of that. Uh, we see a lot of the f folks who are our homeless neighbors who are, who are living on the streets because they are disabled. We have a real lack of ADA accessible housing in San Diego County. A lot of our older buildings have not been upgraded. A lot of our older homes are not required to be upgraded. Um, so we need to invest as a county, and that's one thing that the county can actually tangibly make a difference on is by providing funds for homeowners to be able to upgrade uh, their homes by providing and ensuring and holding accountable uh, land landlords who have big buildings that they are making those accessible and then having a, a department that actually follows up and investigates when uh, landlords are not meeting those obligations so that people can uh, live in their homes comfortably can afford to live in their homes and uh, make sure that their disability is accommodated Candidate I would say that the number one thing we need to address right now is the number of uh, disabled people who are homeless Right now, many of our shelters are not equipped for the disabled. And as I've shared, my dad had multiple sclerosis and he was in a wheelchair by the time that I was a teenager. And then before the forum, I was sharing with a couple from La Mesa in the back, hearing phone calls from my mom calling relatives, begging to borrow money because we needed to convert our bathroom into a handicap accessible. There are profound needs uh, of people who are disabled but right now, what I think we need to focus on is the number of disabled who are on our streets, and we do not have shelters for them. And so on a countywide level, this problem is multifaceted. It is complex. There are so many different issues when it comes to disabled Americans, and also having enough uh, uh, ASL, uh, sign language interpreters as well. So there's just not enough time in one minute to <laughs> basically address all of this, but you can count on me. My heart, because of my experience, would be to help the disabled. Thank you. Candidate McQuaid. Um, so I'm disabled, if you can't tell. Um, and a lot of our communities, our marginalized communities, have what's called healthcare deserts. Um, and when so we do, we don't have a lot of clinics where people can get to. Um, there's a gentleman who lives on my street who's in a motorized wheelchair, and I shouldn't go to the store all the time by himself, right? And we stop and we talk. But his clinic that he goes to is in like a So he's got to get a ride from someone with a specialized van to get there. Healthcare deserts don't provide for the marginalized communities. What that means is we don't have the healthcare in the, in the 
and then these workers save with art. So they have to go long distances to do it, they have to write public transportation, which is dependent on but um, I work with disabled veterans all the time. Um, guys on bruises, para paralyzed, things like that. Guys are a lot worse off than I am. Um, and if you make those available to them in the communities where they're living, they can easily get those services rather than having to go all the way to La Jolla or somewhere else. So as I listen to the question, I can uh, just recall uh, my own uh, personal experience. Um, when I was 12 years old, I got very, very sick and uh, my brothers had to bring me home from Atlanta, Georgia, um, had to help me out of the car, had to call for a wheelchair for me to uh, get through the airport and onto the plane and we had to have accommodations everywhere I went for probably about four years of my young life. And so going through that uh, gave me an additional perspective on uh, the needs of our community of folks who may not have uh, all of the abilities that, that a healthy person has. I, I still deal with a lot of those um, in maintaining my health every single day. But I think it's important, uh, uh, agree with what has been said here, but if we, get, if we begin to make policy and build out our county with folks in mind from the beginning, then we don't have to go back and clean it up. So I think that, well, I have to stop, but I'll try to continue <laughs> with the next question. Yeah. Okay, Nate, you're doing a great job. You've been through 10 questions, and I think we have 87, 88 more. <laughs> so, but what that means is we're not going to be able to get to all of them. Let's, we'll yeah. Let's move on to some climate environment type questions. What would you do for the sewage problem in Imperial Beach? Oh. Can I, can I, which can I? <clears throat> uh, this has been an ongoing disaster uh, since, I think, the Obama administration. Um, I know that the state of California has sued the Trump administration over it, um, but it, it's not, it's a metro problem, and if we're going to hold any great time, we'll move to send our engineers from the United States down to Mexico. We, if they can't pay for it, well, then they're be an IOU. But we're going to send our engineers down there, to rebuild this, this facility that's been leaking for over 10 years. It's an embarrassment to San Diego. Um, I have friends who live in Imperial Beach. I have friends who live in Coronado. Um, it's affecting our disadvantaged youth because all these camps that used to go to the water were canceled this summer or they had to go somewhere else and the kids couldn't get there. Um, we need to invest the funds, the federal funds, and get engineers down to Mexico and just rebuild the whole place and put our technology, which is obviously better than their technology, down there to work for them that will work for us. Candidate Montgomery. <coughs> so we have a lot of leaders in the South Bay um, that have been on top of this issue and have received uh, federal funding for this issue. Um, the problem now that we face is that of the $300 million that was supposed to go towards uh, the renovating and repairing, there, there are a lot of maintenance uh, issues that half of that funding has to be spent on at this point. So what I think we, uh, the, the County Board of Supervisors will want to do and is doing right now is declared a, a state of emergency um, but in addition to that, to continue to stand with those leaders who are at the forefront of this work, some of whom I have been endorsed by, like Mayor Paloma Aguirre, um, you know, it, that is one of the folks that I stand with in these environmental justice issues and will continue to do so. But the federal government, although it's taken a while, uh, they are engaged and involved. We just need more funding to do it, so we have to continue to work together lift up this issue to get more funding to get this thing done. Candidate Goldman. One thing I'm really proud of in my career is I've worked with both uh, Republican and Democratic administrations to get federal action on conserv conservation and climate. During the Trump administration, we passed one of the largest investments in conservation in over 50 years, the uh, Great American Outdoors Act. 
Um, folks might remember when Trump was doing a si signing, President Trump, Trump then was doing a signing ceremony, he held up a bill and he said, Yo Semite, he meant Yosemite. Uh, that was my bill. I'm really proud of that. And the way that we made conservation and climate a priority for a Republican administration was by finding the pain point for them, finding Republican governors in states that had big recreation outdoor economies and making it important to them for their next election. The reason that President Biden went to Pennsylvania and fixed that bridge like that is because Pennsylvania is an electoral state. So what is the priority for the president of the United States? It's winning the next election. How can we make the Tijuana sewage issue more of a priority? By talking about the military, the impact to our Navy, our sailors and our Marines who are training in that water. We need to make it clear that this is a defense priority because that 300 million is not enough. The president could make this a bigger priority if he had the will, we have to make him have that will. Kennedy Franker. The San Diego County Board of Supervisors made the right move by declaring this an emergency, and it is. It's a, it's a climate emergency, it's an, it's an emergency of the environment, and it's not only impacting our environment, it's also hurting our tourism, and also our military too, who are stationed near uh, Imperial Beach. And so at the end of the day, I do believe that this is a federal issue. They're the ones that have the ability to negotiate with Mexico on this, the fact of the matter is, is I can remember being a little kid, and it was Congressman Brian Bilbray, on a, remember that? On a, on a bulldozer on a beach. That's how far back this issue goes. So I believe as county supervisor, what I could do is continue what the county board of supervisors is doing right now. This is an emergency. It needs to be dealt with right now and to pressure the federal government to get this solved once and for all. A recent county study showed that none of the cities in our area are meeting the state's goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. What would you do? Kennedy Goldbeck. Well, this is, a, this is a little bit of a tricky one because it comes into authorities, right? Uh, the county, the cities have their own uh, charters. They have their own rules. Each city in the county, the, the county has authority over the unincorporated areas. Um, but it can do a lot to incentivize. Uh, part of reducing emissions is reducing the amount of time people spend on the roads. And so, again, this comes back to housing and where we're building it. We talked a little bit earlier about thinking about some of these existing urban centers in East County, places like Lakeside and Spring Valley, where there are homes and businesses and people are having to commute all the way in uh, from San Diego or Temecula or Riverside or Mexico uh, in order to live and work. So let's put housing closer to where people already live and work uh, and let's put transit to those areas as well. Um, the county has the authority to uh, help stimulate that. Additionally, the county has the ability to provide grants and funding to cities that are seeking to create more energy efficient um, buildings, to, ch to change out some of their older, less efficient equipment and appliances, and the county can be a big provider of funds and resources on how to do that. Uh, so that's when I am completely agreement on uh, this one. Uh, one thing we may not agree on, though, and I think when it comes to electric vehicles on the road, we're moving too fast. The, the bar has been set too high for what California infrastructure can handle right now. When the last summer when they wanted everyone to buy electric vehicles, but then they told you you can't charge the vehicle because we don't have the electricity today in California to support that. Well, so we need to rethink things at Sacramento level and slow it down. Hybrids are great. Um, my mom drives a hybrid, she loves it. Um, in the meantime, when we, can't, when we don't have the infrastructure to support the electric vehicles here in California, we need to have an interim plan, hybrids, and then eventually work towards electricity once we have, are able to produce enough electricity so people can live comfortably and don't have blackouts and can charge the car and can drive wherever we need to go. Kennedy Montgomery stuff. So I, I think I'm the only one here that, that does agree with the county's decision uh, with regard to the new vehicle bonds traveled uh, formula. And this is the reason why, because we, we have to meet our climate action goals. And yes, there, our separate cities have uh, their plans uh, that they have to meet their own goals, but we have, as a county, a, a lot of resources to be able to support the cities. And in addition, we have to push, push towards electrification. I also served on San Diego Community Power, uh, which is a, a, another option for our residents to have clean energy uh, through a renewable source, which is extremely important. All of these things have to work together and they do require sacrifice. 
I do agree also with mobility hubs and having those in our various communities that are in unincorporated areas, um, especially East County and North County. Uh, but we do need to build those types of hubs um, as we decide what type of housing will go around them. So this requires strategic planning with all of us at the table. When it comes to taking action right now, not about building houses that will be built four years from now or building workplace environments will be four years from now, what I hear a lot of is a lot of, we need to tax this and we need to tax that. So the mileage tax, for example, that's going to be an extra $900 a year for the average San Diegan. And then when we talk about electrification, well, that's going to mean that the average person is going to have to electrify their home which means you'll have to replace your gas appliances. And let's face it, I mean, we can all talk about how we need to make sacrifices, but San Diego, we keep talking about how unaffordable it is, and yet we keep talking about ways that are gonna break the backs of people who are working class and marginalized. So here's my solution. We all know the problem. We need to incentivize rather than penalize people. Rather than say, you're gonna pay a $900 a year mileage tax, why don't we come up with incentivizing ways where people can work remotely? Thank you. I'm gonna take the liberty of combining these two questions. To all the candidates, how will you bring District 4 together to start the healing division that was so prominent? How do you compromise? Candidate Riker. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I challenged Nathan Fletcher last year and he called me every vicious name in the book. It was awful. And I made a vow that I would never do that. And one thing that's really wonderful about the fellow candidates here is after our second forum, I turned to everybody and I said, I vow to you, I will never name call you. I will never name call you. I will never mischaracterize what you stand up for and what you believe in. What we have to do is we have to listen to people that we don't agree with. And let's face it, the Board of Supervisors, they have not been listening. If you go to a Board of Supervisors meeting, a lot of them are too busy playing on their phones. And so if you're gonna take the time to go to the Board of Supervisors, I believe your Board of Supervisors should make eye contact with you. So it needs to start from the top. The Board of Supervisors has to lead from a place of civility and professionalism. And quite honestly, it's not there. I vow I will be professional and civil and bring people together. Candidate Montgomery Stepp. Um, so a minute is not enough because <laughs> this has really been my, my life's work. Um, in my office, we built out the community governance model. And what that means is we take input from our community members and figure out how to take that input, make it into policy, and uh, take it through a bureaucratic process. The reason why I bring that up in this context is because this is all about trust and it's all about listening. It's not whether we agree on every single issue. It's about treating human beings as they are, which are human beings. And I will tell you that being an elected official, you can, I'm just gonna say, you can be an a-hole and still get 50% plus one of the vote. And so it really is a values issue. And I have proven and shown that I lead from my heart with love for the people in places that are at the pits of horrible things that I put the people first and I will continue to do that. Can they go back? Um, you know, my parents, uh, some of you have been here to other forums know that my, my parents are Hindu vegetarian pacifists. Um, when I came out to them, they were like, we love you no matter what. When I told them I was joining the Marine Corps, they were like, these are not the values we raised you with. <laughs> what is wrong? What happened here? Um, look, my dad and I now have uh, very different political views. He's sort of transitioned over to, uh, to, to, to uh, a, a different side of the aisle than myself. Um, but we, we still love each other. And I think it's important that we remember that we're all not one thing. Uh, we, are all, we all contain multitudes. And those of us who are involved, people like you who are here on a Saturday morning, um, even if you have a totally different set of political beliefs than me, you care about your community or you wouldn't be here. And so I think it's really important that we bring that spirit into public service. 
our country and our county are not going to heal and move forward together on the issues that most of us agree on. Like, we want to end the homelessness crisis. We want San Diego to be an affordable place to live if we can at least sit down and have a dialogue. So that, that's the spirit that I'll bring as your next supervisor. Yeah, you're quick. <clears throat> um, leadership does reflect from the top. Um, if the people at the top aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, the people that watch for the example aren't going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, district 4 is, is the most famous district in the county. It also has the highest minority, popul minority population in the county. Uh, but it's not a red or blue issue that is going to fix things. It's purple. Um, the county should be purple when it comes to fixing homelessness. It doesn't matter who you voted for if you're out on the street. It doesn't matter who you voted for if you get mugged. Um, and people need to understand that as we come together as a county, it's, it's the entire county, for everyone that lives here, and for those that are going to come after us, we need to set the example for those that come after us, so they can come and live here in harmony with everyone else. Because we're not going to be here forever, but our kids are going to inherit the earth. They're going to inherit the county, and the example we set for them moving forward is what the example that they're going to live by um, when we're gone, gone from here. Thank you, candidates. Believe it or not, it's almost time to move on to closing remarks. So before we get there, though, um, I want to thank all of you for the phenomenal questions. You can see we did not get to them all. I'm sure these candidates would be happy to entertain them, maybe a little bit this afternoon if you're not running off somewhere, but certainly you can contact their offices and get answers. Um, if you want to learn more about the league, and I think it would be fabulous if you did, we are at lwvsandiego.org or we have a QR code you can scan. Let's go over some of those key dates we talked about at the beginning. The ballots are going to be mailed the week of July 16th. The election day is August 15th. You can mail your ballot back, you can return it in one of the drop-off locations, or you can participate in the 10 days of early in-person voting. If you want more information about where those drop-off locations are and where your polling place is, you're welcome to use sdvote.com. That'll give you all the information you need. Now let's go on to our closing statements. As a reminder, the candidates will have two minutes to conclude. And we'll go in reverse order of the opening statements, which means we'll begin with candidate McCoy. Um, I really just want to thank everyone for being a part of this process. Um, Midterm and special elections traditionally have a very low turnout. Um, every forum we've been to um, that the Open for the Public has been packed, as you can see in the back, it's standing room only. Um, this is very encouraging. Um, I, I think for all of us that people are really invested in this, uh, in this election and they really care about it. And I think they really want to come out and know who they have an opportunity to vote for. And um, we're not going to do these things by ourselves. Um, whoever wins this election, you know, life is going to go on. Um, there's going to be the next election or whatever that person chooses to do. Um, but it's all going to affect everything, everyone in this room. And that's very important. And um, I continue to want to see uh, San Diego County come together. Like I said before, purple um, and not red or blue. Um, it's supposed to be a nonpartisan election, but we know the reality of it is. You know. um, but this has been very, um, this has actually been kind of fun. As a new guy, I didn't know what to expect coming into this kind of stuff. Um, the three other candidates have all done this before. Um, so this has been a learning experience for me. Um, I'm very happy to meet uh, some of the new great people in San Diego. Um, whether I had the support or not, uh, if I run into out of town, you know, if you want to talk to me about the issues, I mean, I'm up for that. Um, if you want to grab a beer, I'm, I'm more up for that. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, like I said, I, I love being in San Diego, and um, I want to continue to be here, and my family to stay here as well. And uh, regardless of how the election turns out, you know, I'm still going to continue to work for the people of San Diego County. Thank you so much, everyone, for engaging in this really, really, really important race. And I'm grateful to be in City Heights, so close to home. 
Um, you know, I have always, in my entire professional career, been dedicated to fighting for our most vulnerable communities, whether that was as an attorney trying to help people keep their one asset in their homes um, during the downturn in the economy, whether that was leading the local campaign, um, Bell Reform, which was a larger state campaign, in ways to interrupt the cycle of poverty that we are seeing on our streets every single day, whether that is being uh, of service to three other elected officials in the city of San Diego on both sides of the aisle, or whether that was walking away from my job after I had just, as Janessa said, buying our home from the bank after I just purchased the condo and had a whole mortgage payment to pay because I couldn't stand by a boss who was racially profiling whether that be a city council member who has had to take some of the most tough votes because my perspective is how will this impact our most vulnerable communities? I want us to be who we say we are. If we are a loving, caring, open San Diego, we need to be that for every single person in every single part of our community in this entire region. My record has shown, this is not talk and this is not hypothetical. My record has shown that I stand in the camp for those who need it most. And I will continue to do that as the first black woman who has ever served as a county board of supervisors. Thank you so much for being here. Very well said. Candidate Riker. Well, you all know why I ran against Nathan Fletcher, but it wasn't until this year at the County Board of Supervisors meeting on May 2nd, and that's when they all met to vote whether or not the election was going to be a special election or an appointment. And the chambers were packed, and there was so much commotion. There were over 100 people there to speak, many of them demanding for a special election. And as I was sitting there in the chambers, I noticed that in the very back row, there was a woman with four children, and I just felt drawn to her. So I introduced myself to her, and it turned out she was a single mom with four kids, and in 19 days, she was going to lose her homeless hotel voucher. And I said, I'm going to help you. Well, little did I know what I was getting into, because over the next several days, it was very complicated. It is not easy, despite popular opinion, for a single mom with four kids on the street to get shelter. And my why is about serving people. It's about seeing human su uh, suffering and jumping in. When the city was gonna fire 2,000 city workers, I jumped into action and we saved them. When San Diego Community College District was gonna fire 50 professors, I jumped in, we saved them. When small businesses were suffering, even in 2021, what we did was we did pop-up open-air markets so small businesses could make a little bit and provide for their families. And so what I want you to know is that I'm here to serve. I'm here to reverse course of the direction where San Diego's been heading. And I just want to let you know that the people that we've been electing in the past are not going to take us there. We need a new direction. Thank you very much. Candidate Goldbeck. I mentioned kind of briefly that I came back to San Diego to take care of my mom. Um, she had a long struggle with multiple sclerosis. Uh, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I was in my early 30s uh, when this happened. And I didn't really, had not planned that for my life to change in such a big way. Um, moving my mom from her home into an assisted living facility that, um, that she could be, receive the care she needed in. Navigating that system, I don't know if anyone else has ever had to navigate that system. I assume many, many people here have for a loved one. Uh, it was an eviscerating experience. I felt so helpless. And I was a captain in the Marine Corps with a master's degree. And I felt like I was in a, a, a morass of information or a lack of information. 
Um, I finally was able to get my mom into a great facility uh, that met her needs. It was extraordinarily expensive. We were only able to afford it because she had a disability pension from her union job, health care from her union job, and money that I was able to provide out of my own pocket. So many people in San Diego do not have those privileges or those resources. And when I think about what people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, I just can't abide. I cannot just let it go by. And I have spent my career saying, this, saying the status quo is not acceptable. When the Marine Corps told me I couldn't have a job because I was a woman, I said, that's not acceptable, and I changed that policy. When folks have said, you can't protect the environment during a Republican administration, I said, I don't accept the status quo, and we passed a massive piece of legislation. When people say we can't solve the homelessness crisis or we can't build enough affordable housing, I don't accept the status quo. I never have. I never will. I think we can do better. This is my home. It matters to me what happens here. I truly believe that San Diego can be the place we want it to be. I have the courage to stand up to the status quo. I have the experience to hit the ground running, and I would be honored to earn your support. Thank you so much for coming out today. It really means a lot. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank Michelle Morgan, our coordinator today, and our other volunteers who make this all possible. I especially want to thank the candidates for your willingness to run and to serve. It's not an easy task. Thank you. Now's our chance to clap and thank them. Um, and I want to thank you again, the audience, because you are here today following our motto, don't just be a voter, be an informed voter. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you.